<laughs> old school. Yeah, who needs them newfangled computer thingies? All right, the speaker session or the speaker system up here says 10:15, so we'll actually attempt to get this started here. So, yes, this is now the State of the Union since there was no State of the Union. How many of you? Uh, you there was a bunch of you who said you've never been to uh, Vegas before. Uh, how many of you are not familiar with what the State of the Union was in the past? Okay, so at least, well, most everyone is, but for those few hands that went up, um, and I won't really count last year, although last year was, it was okay, but typically uh, two of the lead program managers for the Config Manager product group would have a session called State of the Union, uh, Josh Pointer and Bill Anderson. Uh, Josh has actually come back to the team, so that's a good thing, but Bill Anderson recently left the team, so they didn't have this session this year. Um, and of course, they always added style to MMS also. So Kim and I figured that they didn't have it, they didn't bring their style, so we're going to bring our style to MMS. And close out in tradition. I want to thank At for his shirt, though, because I didn't back a Hawaiian shirt. So <laughs> At is with us in this session. <laughs> in spirit. <laughs> All right, so this is kind of the name, and, and I don't know what in the world this name is supposed to mean. Um, I was thinking of True TV. How many of you are familiar with True TV? It's not reality, it's actuality, so um, I don't know, I was in a haze or something when I thought of it, but ultimately this is Kim and I's third annual talk about whatever the hell we want to talk about at MMS, and we'll figure it out later, give some vague abstract, and hopefully they pick us, and this is the third year in the row that they've actually picked us, so unfortunately I don't think there's going to be a fourth, uh, because uh, has anyone heard any rumors besides no rumor? Right. In and of itself, right, that kind of speaks for where everyone at least thinks things are going. So, uh, much to our chagrin, this is it. This the is last it. session of the last MMS ever. In Hawaiian shirts. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, although, how much have you heard about Blue? Right, you've heard the name and that's about it, right? That, that tells you how much pull most people have anymore, right? So, whatever, we'll figure out a way to do these kind of things in the future. We love them, you guys love them, and everybody loves Vegas, so. Alrighty, so we kind of picked five issues. These are mostly ripped from the forums. Um, they're kind of conglomerations of different questions that either come up commonly in the forums or are particular you know, pain points that folks uh, have brought up in the forums that are either unique or something that's applicable to just about every config manager environment in the world. Uh, so you can read those very well. And Kim and I will bounce back and forth and hopefully have some witty commentary on occasion. Witty commentary? Yeah, Me? something like that. No, nah, wouldn't do that. So boundaries, um, I definitely covered this one a little bit earlier this week, so I'm hopefully not going to dwell on some of those points that I went over on Wednesday. Uh, Steve Rahi did have his session yesterday. There's a little bit of overlap. Uh, he mainly talked about implications of boundaries, how they get used uh, when the clients are actually trying to do what they do when they use boundaries. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that, so definitely go look at his session. Go download it off of Channel 9 if you didn't catch it or if you have any lingering questions about how these things actually are implemented in the real world. So each of these little sections is going to have these kind of common questions that come up on the forums all the time. Uh, and so hopefully I'm going to address what most of these are. Uh, and like I said, Steve Rahi definitely has some great material in there also. <clears throat> so I definitely dwelled on Wednesday a little bit on the auto site assignment, something Steve mentioned also. Right? Clients never reassign themselves. There's sometimes this fallacy out there that if you have a CAS and multiple primary sites under it, if you just flip your boundaries, clients are going to automatically assign themselves to a different primary site. It doesn't happen, right? It's a one-time auto-assignment type thing. Clients will not reassign themselves ever. You have to manually reassign a client to another primary site. It's not what boundaries are ever used for. And of course, site assignment is a one-time thing, right, when you install that client. After that, that client is typically never going to uh, need to ever move to another primary site unless you physically move it or it relocates, you know, a laptop for some executive that moved from Hong Kong to, to Shanghai or, you know, who, who, you know, depends upon your architecture there. Um, 
the three uses there, and I'm going to go into a use case on the last one. This is a new piece that I didn't cover at all on Wednesday. Uh, is exactly when and how it gets used for secondary site MP location. Right, so this is one that hasn't been advertised a lot in the past, and it has some um, unique implications in 2012, but it was definitely there in 2007 also. Uh, the first one on the, under the big red X there is a huge misperception also. Right? The location, client location or client selection of both SUPs and MPs, right? because we can have multiples of both of those now in Service Pack 1. But both of those are strictly for high availability. It has nothing to do with client selection of either of those roles. So I can't put an MP or a SUP across the pond and expect my clients in North America not to reach out to it, because it will happen. And if you have any significant size of an organization, you're going to have odd things happen like that, and you're never going to be able to completely guarantee what MP or SUP those things are going to go to. It's essentially a completely random selection and should always be treated as a random selection. Therefore, it's simply for availability. Uh, and of course, on the server side, there's the boundaries, I mean, it really doesn't care. I mean, it pulls in the boundaries, it processes the boundaries, and it gives information back but it doesn't actually make any calculations based upon the boundaries, the site server or the hierarchy itself. Pros and cons, IP subnet boundaries are still evil, as I said before. Um, and, and, and that's really mainly based on a lot of different anecdotal evidence, me going into customers, and it comes from the misperception of what IP subnet boundaries are. At the end of the day, an IP subnet boundary is an IP subnet ID. If you don't know what an IP subnet ID is, you're going to implement these incorrectly. So if you haven't been around in networking since 1995, uh, you may not know what those actually are, right? Because it's an outdated concept. It's still valid, it's still technically correct, it's not actually difficult, but if you're just making an assumption that it's using that subnet mask that you put in to define a range, it's not actually what happens, and you're going to use them incorrectly, and you're going to get weird results. So really the preferred way that everyone kind of should be, like should definitely in quotes there, of defining their boundaries is using an AD site. Why? Because now you can offload that to your AD guys, right? And God knows none of us need more work, and those AD guys sit around doing absolutely nothing anyway. So if they can define everything, if they're the bad guys or the guys that have to go tell the networking guys or yell at the networking guys, hopefully, that, hey, you guys changed stuff on us. Why did you do that? You didn't tell us. Where's Matt Hudson? He likes those kind of things. Uh, he's not in here right now, but. No, he had an 11 o'clock flight, so he's yeah. out. 11 o'clock flight? Yeah. Oh, man, I'm sorry. Um, OK, that's an aside. Um, so it, you know, right. If you're using the 80 sites, it makes your life easier because things are already well defined for you. It's strictly a um, text lookup. So it's a very easy SQL query to happen, right? All of these boundary comparisons that happen when a client asks for something from the site server, so when it tries to do that auto assignment, when it tries to do that content lookup, it's just a quick text comparison. Real easy to do. So then we get to the IP ranges, which conceptually are the easiest ones to deal with. We don't have to worry about things like domains. We don't have to worry about knowing what the heck an IP subnet ID is. We don't have to worry about collecting all of the subnet masks for our 350,000 clients in our environment and who knows what in the world our networking team is doing at all of our locations. We don't have to worry about all those kind of things. The huge caveat though, and this is one that actually didn't even come to light, so it was something that the product team, they knew that they were slower. Uh, but until recently, they've had a couple of cases uh, that they've had to go and investigate. Uh, they actually came up with some pretty hard numbers saying that the processing time of an IP address range is about a thousand times more intensive on your SQL server than for, any, for the other two boundary types. So generally not a good thing if you're already experiencing performance problems, if you didn't properly size right, or maybe even if you did properly size right and you just didn't expect this load. Right? So, it's a tough choice, right? There's no perfect answer in here. If you've got a smaller site hierarchy, IP ranges should work fine for you. They're easy conceptually, they just work. But if you start having lots of subnets because you have lots of remote locations, and now you're having to define all of these different things, you're probably gonna be putting a bigger and bigger load on your, um, 
uh, SQL Server itself. Now remember, this isn't really site assignment. Like I said, site assignment was one time. It's a one time thing that you had to do. So big deal, even if you have 350,000 clients, it's a one time thing for all of those. But now let's say 10,000 clients, 5,000 clients, and you just put whatever package, doesn't matter what packages it's out there, and you're deploying that to all of your clients. And now they're going and doing a content location lookup. What happens? They're all going to the MP, the MP's running the stored procedure on the back end, and they're being very intensive and they're gonna hammer your SQL Server. Uh, so definitely something to consider when you're looking at what types of boundaries to use. <clears throat> now another consideration is that boundaries, of course, must be put into boundary groups in 2012. It's a completely new concept. So for any of you who haven't dove into 2012 yet, you have to remember that I can create all the boundaries I want all day long, and all they do is it exist as a row in the database. They have no functionality whatsoever until you actually put it into a boundary group. <clears throat> so there's two types of boundary groups. These essentially line up with our three use cases, and we'll look at the, the third one, but really our first two use cases of boundaries, and that was content location and site assignment. So generally, you should have a boundary group for your site assignment, and if you have a single primary site in your environment, there's really no reason for you to have more than one boundary assigned to your site assignment boundary group, right? 0000, 0, 0, 0, 0 through 255, 255, 255, 255, that's it, right? Because you have one site, there's really no reason to have anything more than that one site assignment in there. Potentially an oversimplification depending upon your environment, but most likely that's gonna hold true just about everywhere. Content location, of course, uh, gets a little bit more involved. Uh, just because it's gonna be based on either your location or the number of DPs that you have in your environment. Usually, those are gonna be a one-to-one -one ratio, but there are lots of different reasons why you're gonna have a ratio in one direction or another. You're gonna have a DP at a location, or you're gonna have multiple DPs at a location just because of the number of clients that are getting served. So you're gonna have to look at those kind of things, and you're gonna to have to decide, well, which ones of these are important for me to actually have um, the, the actual boundary and the boundary group assigned to. Um, so going back to kind of the numbers, so another number that the product group has thrown out and one that I didn't explain well at all on Wednesday was that 100 to 1 ratio. So essentially what this means is less boundaries, better, right? So the bigger that ratio is, the better off I am. So if I have 1,000 clients to one boundary, great. If I have 1,000 clients to 1,000 boundaries, not so good. So we want that ratio to be as big as possible. Uh, big as in more clients, less boundaries. Uh, as soon as those things start converging, then we're gonna have potentially those performance issues, and it goes back to that thousand times more intensive processing that's happening back on the SQL Server itself. Uh, and along those similar lines, like when I'm talking about IP address ranges too, or even if I'm talking about AD subnets, reducing the number of boundaries. So just because you have a thousand IP address ranges in your environment, that's how many the networking team has defined, doesn't mean that you need a thousand boundaries. You can aggregate those. Hopefully your networking guys have been smart enough to go through and do their own consolidation because they have issues with routing tables as it is. If they have too many routes in their routing tables, you end up having routing flap. Remember, that's something that that router has to do for every single packet that goes through it. So they're gonna have issues also. So they've already hopefully gone through and done this and consolidated their IP addresses in a logical way so now you can take advantage of exactly what your networking team has already done to reduce the number of boundaries that you have in your environment. So it all comes down to kind of that golden rule. Um, is it a hard and fast rule? Absolutely not, right? If you cross it and you don't see performance issues, great, right? So that's really what it all comes down to. Are you seeing performance issues or not? If you're not, carry on, right? It works. If you are starting to see performance issues when you push new content out, so you're seeing you know, just weird things happen on the SQL database, you're seeing spikes in CPU and memory, uh, and of course that's causing other delays in the system. This is something to definitely to investigate and to start looking at how many boundaries you have, if they're logically correct, uh, and of course trying to consolidate them. Um, so the quick demo here. <clears throat> and the cloud is working today. Uh, so yeah, in my lab environment cloud? here, what's that? Did you really say cloud in the last session? Of yeah, <sighs> cloud, cloud. Is anyone playing a cloud drinking game right now? <laughs> Garth? <laughs> cloud, 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 go. <laughs> um, 
so in my lab, I'm using IP address ranges. I have a very simple lab, of course. Uh, now, of course, the interesting thing here, and I didn't have it highlighted right off, is if we go under discovery methods, and we go under our forest discovery, and I'll go to properties, and yes, zoom it's still running, so let me zoom in if I don't click off on the wrong thing. All right, see that bottom one, that bottom one that's checkbox there, the automatically create IP address range boundaries. So that's why I have IP address range boundaries in my lab environment, because Forest Discovery actually created them for me, right? Good thing there. Um, that was something that Kim and I, hopefully, we can kind of take credit for spearheading on the, on the product group for that one, because in the betas, this actually created IP subnet IDs. Well, that's a bad thing, because in Active Directory, you're not actually defining subnet IDs. Right? You're actually defining ranges. So they don't equate to each other. So you end up having these mismatches between what was in Active Directory and what was actually defined in Config Manager. And then there would be like mass confusion because uh, there's a total disconnect of what those things actually are. Uh, but you have to be careful, once again, this could be causing your performance issues in your environment. Make sure you're rational about everything and understand where things are coming from. So going back to the boundaries themselves, uh, it was on the one slide there. Uh, if the boundary is not assigned to a site assignment boundary group, it won't actually go into Active Directory either. So most of you hopefully know uh, that the boundaries ultimately get put into Active Directory. At least they did in 2007. The big change for 2012 is only the boundaries that are in a site assignment boundary group get put into Active Directory. All content location lookups go directly to the MP, and there's no reference ever to Active Directory there. Um, so here are my two boundary groups. Actually, I guess I have more than two boundary groups. But I actually have a content location boundary group for each one of my locations. Obviously, fictional locations. This is just my little lab sitting in my office at home. Um, and thank God it's up. And the cloud is there. I have three content location lookup boundaries. Now, I haven't actually assigned a DP to Amsterdam because I only have a couple people in Amsterdam, you know, Peter and my peeps. Uh, and it, Ann Arbor, I do have a DP assigned, but that's actually my DP that I have sitting in San Antonio in my home office. Uh, but it's still nice to have those separated out. So let's look at my San Antonio boundary group here. And I can actually do the show members or I can do the properties. Uh, and in this case, we've assigned the boundaries to this content location boundary group. And here are my references. Let me zoom in on the bottom there. Notice the top is for my site assignment. I don't have site assignment assigned to that boundary group because, once again, I want to have some separation. In this case, I have that single primary site, so there's simply no reason for me to be assigning any other uh, boundaries to that, or I can just assign all my boundaries to that one boundary group without ever having issues with it. So on the bottom, here's my content location, my one and only distribution point in my lab. And, of course, there's a connection thing there also. So this is the slow and the fast boundaries. Uh, Slow boundaries and fast boundaries aren't used for a whole lot except for determining if content gets downloaded or not. So in each and every type of content, software updates, packages, applications, you can define what happens if a client is within a slow boundary. And you can say, hey, you're in a slow boundary. You shouldn't be downloading anything. And so that's exactly where you come into the boundary group itself based upon the distribution point. And I can say, hey, this is a slow boundary. If a client falls in this boundary and needs to go to this distribution point, then don't actually download the content, and of course, don't install it. So VPNs are the classic case for that one, right? If a user's at work, great, he can download stuff all day long. But if he's over a VPN, him downloading something, probably not a good thing, because he could be sitting in Mandalay Bay in his hotel room, and we all know what the hotel room internet connectivity is like. Uh, not so good, right? And so you're just going to suck up his pipe, and he's not going to be able to browse whatever guys browse when they're in Vegas. <laughs> So here's our site assignment boundary group. Uh, similar type thing. Now, in this case, I chose not to create another boundary. I just used the ones that Active Directory Forest Discovery actually created for me. But I could have just created that one like I described before, 000, 255, 255, 255, 255. 255. Thank God that's not a tongue twister. Um, and I just put all of my different boundaries in here. And of course, there's actually a fourth boundary type I haven't talked about. You can always can see that in there. And is, anybody can spell IPv6 in here? Um, it's obviously not something that's very common uh, in the real world, at least not in internal networks. It's starting to get more traction on the Internet. If you live in certain Far East Asian countries like China, 
Uh, that's what they're doing almost exclusively because they're doing very new things over there and everything's brand new, so they went with the latest and greatest technology. Uh, so you probably won't ever see these in an internal environment for, you know, five, ten years. Uh, but Config Manager is perfectly capable of using the IPv6 uh, boundaries. In this case, all of that other stuff that we talked about more or less kind of goes away because IPv6 is uh, very controlled and all you have to do is put the prefix in and you're done with it. And of course, we'll go to the references tab here. Same type of thing, kind of a reverse of the other boundary group. So at the top we have our site assignment, and there's our assigned site. Okay, so that third use case is really kind of an interesting one. It's a little bit of a fringe case. Uh, I wouldn't say fringe case. It's a lesser used case, depending upon what's in your environment. Uh, and it's actually not a huge deal, but it's something very important to plan for and know about before your networking guys come screaming down the hall. Uh, so essentially, we have our system that's going to fall within our secondary site that we want to report to our secondary site. Uh, of course, we all know clients can't be assigned to a secondary site, right? They can only be assigned to primary sites because only primary sites can manage clients. However, if we set up our boundaries correctly, uh, when the resource is actually created, the initial, uh, you know, our client is actually no. So at this point, no client agent that's actually on the system. Initially, of course, our site's going to be empty. Now, discovery's going to run. There's the animation. Um, and actually, I skipped past one real quick. There we go. So after discovery runs, in this case, we actually have uh, the PR1 is the site assignment boundary group for this, right? So the client or the resource at this point is going to get assigned to PR1. So the implication of that is that PR1 is actually going to be doing our client push. So it's the one if you go into ccm.log, you'll see it initiate the client push. Well, if you've looked through CCM log, the only thing it really, really does is push CCM setup.exe. CCM, it's ultimately CCM setup's responsibility to pull everything else down. So is this a good thing or a bad thing for your environment? Because typically you put that secondary site out there because it's somewhere else, right? It's a uh, a distant location. So CCM setup's pretty small, but it's still maybe something that you don't want to happen in your environment, right? Remember, CCM setup then is actually going to go and find the DP to pull the rest of the content down. It's a completely new thing for 2012. In 2007, it always went to the management point. In 2012, it actually queries the management point and does a content location request, just like it does for all other content. So at the end of the day, is CCM setup coming across the WAN a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. That's ultimately for you to determine. So the other scenario is we actually have our content location and our site assignment boundary group for SS1 for that resource, and he's going to fall into both of those. In this case, after discovery runs, the site for that resource is going to be SS1. So remember we said the clients can't actually be assigned to a primary site. Well, in this case, he's not really a client, right? He's just a resource sitting in the console. And the reason it gets set to SS1 is because we want CCM setup to actually come from the secondary site. So the only real major difference here is CCM setup.exe. Where is it coming from? Our primary site or our secondary site? So you don't have to really get caught up in that if you don't really care. But if you do care where that's coming from, maybe you have 5,000 systems attached to that secondary site. Or maybe you have 10,000 because you scaled that secondary site up. Uh, that may not be a good thing to push, you know, even that, I don't even know how big, you know how big CCM setup is, a meg? It's, it's not very big, right? It's a small file. So the question is, how do you control the push? So, yep. So essentially it's about the boundary groups that you set up, right? So if you set up your content location boundary group for SS1 for your secondary site, that's where it's going to come from. If you set up your content location boundary group for PR1, then that's where it's going to come from. Is that cleared up? No, not at all. Um, so the best way to really go through that one uh, is I have a blog post. It's actually the first blog post in the slide deck. And I have explicit details on that one uh, to tell you exactly what's going on. Ultimately, it comes down to if the client is in a content location boundary group, right? In this case, we're not talking about site assignment boundary groups because it's not used for MP location for secondary sites. So it's a content location boundary group. If the client ends up in the secondary site's content location boundary group, it's going to pull it from there, or it's going to get pushed from there. 
That depends upon which content location boundary group that client is in. It, it all comes down to that content location boundary group. These are lots of references that are in the slide deck. Like I said, Steve Rahi's session goes into the implications, like fallback, right? What happens when we actually have content fallback? Uh, there's that wonderful little checkbox that's in all of our packages that says, yes, I can fall back, or actually it's in the distribution points in 2012 now, that says enable this as a fallback distribution point. He goes into all those scenarios and exactly what happens. And our wonderful transition to client identity and Kim. Thank you very much. So client identity is a, a next topic we wanted to talk a little bit about, because Config Manager has quite a bit of different identities on identifying what a resource uh, exactly is. So we'll, we'll tackle that um, during this particular part of the presentation. And we have some common questions we have on um, those identities. And the first one is, why am I getting duplicate goods? And for those of you that have been around in Config Manager and as a mess for a longer time, that used to be a pretty severe pain point um, to which people came up with all sorts of uh, clever solutions and uh, resource kit tools like TrendGuid and so on. Luckily, in Config Manager 2012, we see fewer and fewer issues um, with uh, duplicate goods. The only real reason we've, uh, we've uncovered so far um, is creating duplicate GUIDs when you actually have an identical client certificate on the client side. So if you have a client certificate, that's being used to generate an identity. Those are identical because you didn't clean them up after a sysprep. Um, or we've seen some cases in which Exchange servers get installed with the same client certificate. That would make you generate duplicate goods. That's what that's about the only case we've seen so far that actually generates duplicate GUIDs um, in Coffee Manager 2012. Right. Now, why is having duplicate GUIDs bad? Well, obviously, if you have duplicate GUIDs, you might be sending out all sorts of deployments to resources where you figured, I'm sending it to this one, and a lot of the other ones might just as well get it because they just have that same GUID. Now, when and how are clients' identities preserved? That's largely something that integrates with, uh, with restaging and OS deployments. When you reinstall a machine, how do you can, can you make sure that a client's identity after the installation is the same thing as it was before you restaged the machine? And if you want to talk about when and how a client identity can be preserved, we actually need to go to the next slide, and I'll do that in a minute. On what identity do you actually want to preserve? Because Jason and I identified five different, way, five different ways that could mean an identity to a Config Manager client. So what do all those identities do, and which one would you want to preserve, and which one you wouldn't care less about? All right, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then the last slide goes into that same thing as well, and I'll elaborate on that in the next slide. Is the window SIT being used uh, for the Config Manager client identity at all. all right. What do we do with that set? And that is actually new for Config Manager 2012, that we actually do make use of the Active Directory domain set of a machine to do some of the things with the Config Manager 2012 client. And obviously, I assume most of you know the set that a computer has. It's actually the identity it has in Active Directory, and originally, it didn't have much to do with Config Manager. If you're still on Config Manager 27 or, heaven forbid, SMS 2003 or even more, heaven forbid, SMS 2.0, um, then the security identifier doesn't really have much influence in our config Configuration Manager or SMS environment. In Configuration Manager 2012, though, you might have noticed that if a client gets discovered, we actually discover the domain SID as well. If you open the properties of a Configuration Manager 2012 client, you'll notice the SID is there. And that's actually a pretty awesome thing. And Jason and I, uh, at the MVP Summit, actually asked the PM that came up with that marvelous ID. Uh, but we're still figuring out who figured that out on how to do this. But the nice thing about the SID is that if you now restage a machine, then you can actually preserve all of the other identities relatively easy. 
uh, in Config Manager 27, I assume most of you have restaged machines. And if you restage them outside of the live operating system, or you didn't have native mode, then we would all see that issue that the identity was actually lost because we created a new resource record, and we would obsolete the old one, and then a whole bunch of the other identities, like the resource ID, all of a sudden were gone. So all your direct collection memberships, gone, because that's based on resource IDs. In Configuration Manager 2012, we actually have the option that a lot of people were actually looking for to automatically merge those records. In Config Manager 2007, we could specify that we'll manually merge them, but we, there was no way to automatically merge them, because automatically merge them actually has some security implications that you actually don't want to do. You don't want to merge two resources for which you don't know they're totally identical, because they'll get software and things installed. So you don't want to do that. So automatically merging was not an option. And again, as we are a bunch of community members, people came up with ways to do automatically merge anyway and say, I don't care about the security implications. I just want this to be wor working and to be practical. But in Configuration Manager 2012, since we now have the SIT, we actually use that even when restaging outside of the live operating system to make sure we automatically merge those records and hence keep the same resource ID and keep the same GUID. Now, how does that work? Well, it actually works by checking that if I join a machine to the domain again, if that computer is still there, then I'll get the same SID. If you join a machine with the exact same name and you have permissions to reset the password on that object and delete the object and so on, so you need some permissions to be able to do that. But if your joined domain account can do that, you'll just join it with the exact same name and you'll get the exact same domain SID back. Now, what Configuration Manager 2012 does with that, if, if the domain SID comes back as being identical, then apparently you did have enough permissions to overwrite that record, which gives me enough certainty that you probably have enough permissions and that the security implications of joining those two systems together into one resource record is probably okay. You had the power to actually delete his computer account and reset it. If you have that power, then probably merging both records is okay. So that's what the computer SID does in Configuration Manager 2012 which means that you get to keep your resource ID. Right? For uh, quite a few of you, this actually might mean you have to change some of your processes, though, because I've seen quite a few customers that either in processes or even built in into their configuration manager task sequences, they actually have tasks that go in and delete the previous computer record so that it's gone, and then they actually create a brand new one. Now, if that's your current process, you'll see the behavior we have in Configuration Manager 27. Right. You'll have an obsolete client record, and the old record will be obsolete, have the old resource ID, and you'll get a new record with a new resource ID. So if your current processes go in and delete the computer in Active Directory prior to restaging it, stop doing that, and you won't have that behavior, and you'll be able to preserve identity. Right. The other way to preserve identity is the same as it was in Configuration Manager 27. If you actually restage from an the life operating system and you kick off your task sequence there, then we'll migrate the identity for you and we'll keep it. And the other way is actually relatively similar to what we now have with the computer SID, yet it requires much more, of, uh, much more work setup-wise. If you actually work with client certificates, that's what we did in Configuration Manager 27. If you were able to apply for the certificate with the same subject name, which actually means you're restaging with the same name, that Configuration Manager 2007 would preserve your identity as well. Right. You apparently figured out how to get a client-side certificate with the exact same name of another machine. If you have that permission, again, I assume the security implications are smaller. Right. So then we have the global unique identifier, which is one of those other identifiers we use in uh, Configuration Manager um, 2012. There's not all that much to say, but obviously it's an important uh, identity, so we added it to it. There's not much detail on how that gets generated. Right? It's top secret. Nobody knows how the GUIDs are actually um, being generated. The only thing I have to say on that one is we usually, we, every once in a while, we cheat that to create load balanced collections. Right? So we create collections based on the GUID, and we look at the last character in the GUID and specify, well, if it's one, you go to that collection. If it's two, you go to that collection. 
um, or by grouping the, them together, one and two, you can actually create some sort of automatic load balancing of those collections and see who's on there. And then there's the hardware identifier. The hardware identifier is a fun piece. It's actually generated by the operating system. And we just keep on, uh, keep on using it. The hardware identifier is a part in which we know we actually restaged the machine because the hardware was totally identical. Right? So there's a couple of parameters that go into that. One of the most, uh, most interesting ones or one of the most funny ones is actually the SM BIOS ID. Right? Or at least I think that's one of the more funny ones. Because the SM BIOS ID is one of those parameters that potentially can change an entire hardware ID once you do P2V operations. Right? So I actually had a customer that did quite a bit of P2V operations. What can go wrong with P2V? We've done them a hundred times, so we're going to do P2V. But that particular customer was on Coffee Commander 2007 with AppV, and they had the checkbox sec sec uh, selected on all their AppVs to automatically uninstall if the application is no longer targeted. So they P2V'd all those machines. All those machines got a new hardware ID, uh, evidently. So new hardware ID, new resource records, all of their collections tended up to be empty. Moments later, all their um, Citrix servers determined that they were no longer targeted with that V application. Let's quickly remove those. Uh, worked wonderfully well. Everything worked as designed, not exactly what they anticipated for though. So the hardware identifier is one of those items that helps you generate identity as well. Uh, and then obviously there's the resource ID which I briefly explained already. The resource ID is actually a number that just, it's just a number that starts, we used to start at one and then just go all the way down and every time a new resource was added, we added another, we incremented the resource ID by one. In Coffee Commander 2012, we decided to start somewhere 16 million, 16 million, and then go from there. All right, whatever. Um, and then there's a client certificate if you decide to go for what we used to call native mode, we no longer have native mode, we can be much more granular in which our system use HTTPS, then we have the client certificate. And the client certificate is the, uh, the same identity at that point in time, and as I just mentioned with the SIT um, previously, if you're allowed to request a client certificate with the exact same subject name, then I'll assume you're the same identity and I'll keep that resource ID and all the other identifiers in sync and in line so I don't have to create a new record. All right. So that's the client certificate. That's another way of making sure client identities keep in sync and are reused as opposed to creating new client identities every time you restage them. All right. So then the machine sit duplication mit is one of the references we, uh, we have on there. And that's a blog of Mark Rosinovich um, that the SIT isn't all that important because it usually doesn't leave, uh, leave the machine. There's some borderline cases with um, ghosting or re-imaging domain controllers, which probably now that that is supported in virtual environments is fixed in uh, Windows Server 2012, although we still need to investigate that. So the actual SIT doesn't really matter. Um, that doesn't mean sysprep doesn't really matter. Sysprep has a lot of plugins in fixing all sorts of other identity-related issues that are relevant in doing machine duplication. So the SIT isn't relevant. We've always thought that we run Sysprep so that the SIT changes. That's a tiny little portion of it and probably not the most important part. But Sysprep cleans up a whole bunch of other things, like our um, client side self-generated certificate that we generate for Configuration Manager, Sysprep will take that out. So it'll take out a whole bunch of other identities as opposed to the client SIT. So that's why it still matters. All right. And then um, there's a blog post on there um, from Eric Holtz that wrote a blog post back in SMS 2003 SP1 when they first introduced the client obsolescence and the active um, Record, and he actually explains how that actually works based on the hardware ID. And he has some explanation in there that, well, the hardware ID is used to create that initial identity, and he has some uh, explanations on older laptops that, if you look at how it's generated, there's some older laptops that might actually generate 
identical GUIDs because of the way that actually work. Okay. Not something you'll probably see in a configuration manager 2012 environment, but I still rely on that every once in a while to explain how client identity is actually generated and how that obsolescence works, because not much has changed since they first introduced that in SMS 2003 SP1. All righty. Anybody not know who Mark Rusinovich is? Garth, that's the alcohol talking. Nah, you didn't know who Jeffrey Snover was, you know who, who Rusinovich is. <laughs> Anybody not know who Jeffrey Snover is? <laughs> If you, if you know PowerShell, which everyone knows PowerShell, right? Repeat after me. I love PowerShell, right, Gar? <laughs> Kaido is going to help you with that one. Can do, can do a wave for it. Yeah, there you go. PowerShell wave. OK, uh, so the next one, I skipped past it. Business hours, maintenance windows. This maintenance windows are our old wonderful friend. Business hours are our new wonderful friend uh, that seem to do the exact same thing but don't really do the exact same thing. Um, so really, the questions always come down to which ones take precedence, uh, which ones uh, should I be using, how do I set business hours, since if you look through the interface, there's nothing in the console to be able to do this. You actually have to go to the clients to be able to do this. And of course, how do they work together? Uh, so really, the key fact, and there's a wonderful blog post, it's in the uh, reference here, and it goes through a bunch of different scenarios. Uh, I think Dave Randall wrote this blog post. It's part of the product team. Um, and he goes through all these different scenarios, great explanations. There's one key fact at the very end of it that you always have to keep in mind, and that's that first bullet up here. If there's a deadline, nothing else matters, right? The maintenance window will move it, of course. We all know that. But as far as business hours go, it doesn't matter. There's a deadline. That's what you as an administrator want to happen, and it will happen. So regardless of whatever the user's business hours are. Config Manager Agent, we all know and love. It's the one that does the enforcement. Uh, and of course, the maintenance window, like we just mentioned, it kind of dictates when the Config Manager Agent can do things. Uh, but if that deadline's there, it's ultimately going to happen within a maintenance window. And uh, user initiation of a deployment, uh, right? So if I'm a user and I want something to run, I don't care about business hours, I don't care about maintenance windows. Ultimately, the user is not the master of their box, but there's someone that you want to have interactivity with that box. You want to have some say in exactly what goes in that, on that box, because they're the ones that are hopefully being productive. We all have productive users, at least a few. Uh, they're the ones that are actually hopefully being productive, and it's those few that are productive that we don't want to disrupt. We don't want to reboot them while they're giving a presentation. We don't want to reboot Mary Jo, the CEO's secretary, i.e. the most important person in your organization. Uh, we don't want to disrupt what she's doing. So quick comparison, business hours are all about the user. Maintenance windows are all about the administrator, right? So the administrator is the one that's dictating intent. That's kind of what maintenance windows are all about and deadlines are all about. This is when I want these things to happen. The maintenance windows put some constraints about when they actually can happen, uh, but that's the administrator's intent of when he wants those deadlines or those deployments to actually happen. Whereas with the user, they may be like, great, that's all well and good, just don't disrupt me. So, you put this deadline out next week, but why can't I install that earlier? Why can't I install that now? Security updates, great example of this. If I can actually have my compliance numbers go up because of this, this is perfect. Um, Chris Jackson, the app compact guy, gave a session yesterday, wonderful session, go catch it uh, on Channel 9 if you weren't there. Uh, and he went into a lot of the psychology of what users do and don't do. Um, and he said, and he went into a little bit of detail around this, right, that if you can get your users involved with what you're doing, give them some empowerment, actually make them feel like there's a little bit of control in what they do, uh, then they're going to be much more involved. If you actually ask the users, hey, can you do this for me? You know, you're special, right? Here's this new laptop. You're special. That was the example he gave. In this case, hey, you know what? There's some updates out there. Can you go please do them? And give them power over their destiny of when those things happen you're going to get much more compliant users, users that are much more willing to work with IT and get things done, and they're also going to be users that are going to be a little more tolerant of errors. Right? So if something actually errors out that they initiated, it's okay, instead of it actually happening while the user's actually trying to do work. So quick scenario here, uh, and this one is almost explicitly directly from a forum post, so uh, if you happen to be in this room, you probably recognize this one. 
But essentially, we have our client business hours. Um, and I know that's probably a bit much for Kim, but uh, we'll just pretend, right, that, that maybe he'll work that's, out. That's about the time I present to be, pretend to be working. There you go. Pretending's a good thing. Um, uh, we have our maintenance window from 9 p.m. to 4 a.m., right? So that's obviously after hours. Now, with the workstation, sometimes that's not a good thing to have a maintenance window, right? Because what happens if that user turned the box off? or unplugged it, or there's a power outage, or they took it home because it's a laptop. We probably don't want things necessarily to happen while they're at home. Or maybe they just never turn it at home, right? They pretend they're working. They take their laptop. Yeah, boss, I'm going to do that work tonight. But they don't. So there's no way those things will ever happen because that system won't be on during those maintenance windows. So something to always consider when using maintenance windows. In this scenario, though, we do have a maintenance window. We have our installation deadline, which is actually within the maintenance window, so really shouldn't be affected by it and our deployment start time. So what happens at the deadline if no one's using the computer? Once again, go back to rule number one, deadline wins, right? 9.30, that one's pretty clear cut. Users working at 9.30, 9.30, it's gonna happen again, doesn't really matter, deadline wins. Computer's off, well there's not much we can do if computer's off once again. But now if it's on the next evening, it's gonna happen at 9 p.m., right? The deadline's in the past. The config manager agent's always going to be looking for those things. So just because the deadline was in the past, and I'm glad they actually changed the name to deadline here instead of just a schedule, right? Because it's not just something that's supposed to happen at that time. That's the time when it's supposed to be enforced or supposed to be uh, something that is applied to that system. Anything after that time, if it's not applied, then the config manager agent needs to catch up and actually do it. So of course, it's going to wait till the maintenance window. We always wait for maintenance windows. And it's going to happen 9 p.m. in the next evening. So now here's the next interesting case, and this is really where they start colliding. The user enables the installation during non-business hours, and I'll show you this one real quick, exactly how a user would potentially do this. So this is the user going through their daily work. They get a little pop-up, right? So pop-ups are good, in my opinion, in general, because you're getting that user involved. So it's going to pop up, and now the user's going to say, I want this to install as soon as possible. It's important. IT's let me know how important it is and how big of a part I am of keeping my enterprise secure so I'm going to go ahead and schedule this outside of my business hours because I know I'm not going to be working then and it's going to help everybody out. So it's going to happen at 8 p.m. automatically. So let me hop into that really quick. It's a really quick and short one. And There's a question up front. Oh. What if that yeah, so that's, that's the rub with workstations, right? And that's why you have to carefully evaluate. So quickly, the, the question for those that didn't hear is what happens if that computer is always off during maintenance windows? Uh, if it's always off, then your maintenance windows are invalid and something's never going to happen. So typically, maintenance windows are great for servers. Your servers should never be off, right? Uh, so they're perfect for that. With your workstations, you have to be very careful about what maintenance windows you set because you have to guarantee some time that they're up. And even wake on land technologies aren't necessarily going to address this issue. They could if you had all desktops. But if you don't have all desktops, you have that traveling laptop that goes home every night. Or you have a power outage, or you know, for whatever reason, you have a security guard that likes to go around unplugging things. Right? Any of those weird type of scenarios, which we all have, uh, then it's never going to happen. So you have to be very careful with maintenance windows on clients. So here's my client. And the user received a bunch of updates here. And he gets this nice little notification. This is a little bit more in your face when it first pops up, of course. And they're going to go, OK, I'm going to help IT out here, because I actually like IT. They, they tell me they like me. I'm not sure what they say behind closed doors, but they tell me they like me. And here I have the option. I can do it now, right? So I'm going to lunch right now. Why not let it do it? You know, all my work's saved, uh, and it's going to be friendly. It's not going to disrupt me at all. Or I can say outside of my business hours. Now, of course, I can look at my business hours. There's no months in here, so we can't exclude July or August for the Europeans, but <clears throat> we can still um, you know, do the, the daily basis and we can adjust those kind of things. And this is exactly where our times are. This is strictly from the user's perspective. And now, at, in this case, this is not the times from that scenario, but now in this case, at 10 p.m., that's outside my business hours, if I did that, this is automatically going to install ahead of the deadline which us as IT people are great because now my compliance numbers are going to start going up earlier and of course my environment uh, is going to be that much better off. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, so two quick things there. That's that great blog post that by Dave Randall that I talked about. Uh, the second one there is, um, as you can read, Auf Deutsch. So you can use a wonderful um, Bing translator, or there's that G translator, or there's some other trash out there. Um, and, and Torsten actually wrote that one. And essentially, it's a script that will go and run. You can run it as a package via Config Manager, of course, that will run on each one of your client systems and set those business hours. So for some reason, you don't like those business hours that your users are setting. Uh, you know, you think they should be working longer or whatever. Now you can actually go dictate those things to your users and be really heavy-handed, like the Germans typically are, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and as you may know, Jason and I usually try to make our sessions educational slash entertaining. Reading a German blog post translated by Google Translator or Bing Translator is going to do exactly that. It's going to be an educational, entertaining experience. All right. Deployment type evaluation, and I'll try to be brief because Jason suddenly uh, um, kind of reminded me that I was stealing too much time on client identity, so my shin still hurts. So um, I'll do that a little bit more briefly. And I'm going to quickly go through the animated slide and just put it out immediately. Most of you have probably seen this evaluation flow um, on the application deployment model before, or at least portions of it. Right? This is the evaluation flow slide that most of us use when we first explain the application um, evaluation. The only thing that's, uh, that's different, though, is that most people do know that if you look at the top of the um, evaluation flow. If you have multiple deployment types and one of the deployment types do not match, then obviously we fall through to the next deployment type. That's the whole idea with having multiple deployment types, yet the slide you typically see doesn't have that little arrow going back. So we are trying to be more explicit. What I want to mention on this application evaluation flow, um, largely though, is that obviously we start up with checking whether the requirements are met. Right? If that's not the case, well, either we go to the next deployment type, and if this was the last deployment type in the application evaluation flow, we just stop. All right, then it's done. If that is done, we go for the detection method, and we check whether the application is already installed. And if that's already done, then, okay, we'll stop our application evaluation flow altogether or potentially go back to the next deployment type. Now, if there's dependencies in the application, that's one of the portions that it's not very well documented. Actually, was one of the quiz questions for our Config Manager Expert Guru panel that we uh, that we had on stage. Um, if you have dep dependencies and you have installed dependencies enabled, then obviously the dependencies will be installed. But if you have dependencies, you actually have the option of specifying, "I don't want this dependency to be installed." Right? Now, what happens there is that. Just as with having multiple deployment types and the global conditions or the requirement rules aren't met, you actually fall through to the next deployment type as well, right? which can be practical in a couple of cases, um, especially in cases where you have 32-bit and 64-bit add-ons. And you want to install the add-on based on what sort of dependency uh, or based on what version the original application had. Right? So this is one of the scenarios that's useful in installing Office 64-bit or Office add-ons. Right? You have an Office add-on you want to install, on top of Office, obviously. But there's no good way of knowing which version of Office was already installed. So instead of creating a requirement rule or basing that on architecture, because you could, could have perfectly installed a 32-bit Office on a 64-bit operating system, what we typically do there is we create dependencies for Office, or if it's 32-bit or, 32 or Office 64-bit, and we specify we don't want to auto-install. So that way, you can actually make sure that if the office is 32-bit, I'll install the 32-bit add-in. If the office is 64-bit, I'll install the office 64-bit add-in. Right. So that's one of those scenarios. You can solve that way. Question? What happens if you supersede a dependency which you would uninstall the old one? That kind of depends. Supersedence um, ha actually has conflict resolution. So it kind of depends if uh, there's a dependency on whatever you're trying to supersede, we might block you from uninstalling that. Because there's a dependency there for the application, so we might break an application that's already deployed. In general, the way you should look at it is the entire application model is actually created, or most of the decisions made within it are based on let's be as less disruptive for the end user as possible. 
and there's no, not always a perfect solution, but that's why install always wins over uninstall, right? That's one of the main, one of those items in the application model, because we want to be as less intrusive as possible. If I install an application where it shouldn't be, well, okay, that means I'll see, the user will see an icon and the application will be there. Okay, big deal, not all that disruptive to the end user, might not be fully desirable, but still less design. The, the other, the inverse por portion, uninstalling where the install should still be active is probably less desirable. So you'll see the same thing in supersedence and dependencies. There's an application that's already installed and that has a dependency, and you are, now you're creating a new deployment for it through supersedence that might upgrade that application yet it might break the application he's already working with now, right? So there, again, what we decide or what we think is the least disruptive is to make sure the application he has right now all remains functional, right? Which in that particular case might mean that the new application might not be functional, but that, again, is the least disruptive way, right? The good thing to do is make sure that your dependencies get updated with the superseded version, and then everything will smooth out. All right. So common questions on the application model. So I'll briefly go over those because the application model is great. We all love it. A lot of customers love it. Problem with them all loving it is that all of a sudden they want to do all everything in the application model. It should be in the application model. Well, not everything needs to go in the application model. So every once in a while we'll get the question, when do you use applications and when do you use package and programs? The answer to that that I usually give is relatively simple. The application model is a state-based engine, meaning if it gets uninstalled, we'll reinstall it. Right? If you remove it, we'll reinstall it, and I usually make the same joke over and over and over again. If you uninstall my stuff and I still deploy it to you, I'll reinstall it at application reevaluation time. You can uninstall it afterwards, and I'll reinstall it afterwards. At a certain point in time, either one of us is going to give up. It's probably not going to be us. Right. So, but the application model is a state-based engine. So when you use packages and programs, if having a state-based engine makes no sense at all, right, packages and programs are perfect for that. Right. If you're going to send out scripts, right, maintenance, uh, maintenance scripts you use, stuff you want to use, script-based to populate WMI clauses so you can inventory them later on, a whole bunch of those scripts have no meaning or no sense at all in being state-based, right? So if state-based doesn't give you any benefit, then don't create an application model out of it, because that means you have to define a detection method and actually do all that work for no benefit, right? So that's when you use packages and programs, right? So how does the client determine which deployment type to run within an application? Well, you actually just show the application evaluation flow on how um, that uh, can work. And then can I use ID security groups as global conditions? Well, my general take on that, because it's a popular question, is to me, and what I've stated before, is if you want to use global conditions, do them on, on data that is available locally on your system. Right? Don't use global conditions for data that you have to find out somewhere on an external system. So can you do Active Directory security groups as global conditions? Well, Yes, but preferably not by going out to Active Directory and querying it there, right? There are ways to actually look at your local access token and figure it out there. I'm probably cool with that. I don't, I'm not a huge fan of going out to external systems. Same thing for Active Directory security groups. And one of the things you have to be aware of, because there's actually a forum post and a blog post on using Active Directory security groups as global conditions, because there's a lot of people that actually want to do that. There's one thing you have to be uh, very aware about if you do that, specifically for Active Directory security groups, or anything else where you get data from an external system. Because that means, instead of using collections for targeting, you're starting to use global conditions. I think that's actually on my next slide. All right. If you don't use collections for your targeting, and you rely much more on global conditions, like for those security groups, what happens is if you target that way towards computers or required to users, that means those policies all come down to your system and get down in WMI. Right? So any computer-targeted deployment or any required 
uh, deployment to a user. We'll make sure the policy gets downloaded in WMI on the client side and will get re-evaluated. Right. So if you don't use collections and you just rely on global conditions in this particular case or thing we were talking about, groups in global conditions, and you target computers, that means I'm not doing much targeting, so I might have 500 applications I send out to you because I decide to filter them out on global conditions. That means that particular client will have 500 policies stored locally in WMI. And as you all know, I love WMI, but WMI is not built to store huge sets of information. And application policies are a bit larger than all of the other ones. And at application re-evaluation time, you'll have to run through all of those applications and see whether they are actually installed. Right. So you'll have quite a bit of load there. Secondly, every time you open Software Center, it'll run through and see which applications do I actually need to display for this particular computer, because it'll try to filter out based on the global conditions up front, and it'll do it then as well. Right? Assume, if you think about that, it'll be a huge um, thing, of, thing to do for that particular client. Assume you multiply that with 350,000 clients going out to Active Directory for those 500 applications. So all of a sudden, I'm doing a bazillion number of LDAP queries towards my domain controls to see whether my computer or my user happens to be in that particular group. Right? Most Active Directory designs are not designed to basically get a bazillion requests every week. Right? So you might want to be aware of that particular scenario. Now, there's a blog post and a forum post out there on a guy that actually does that with global conditions. And I actually responded to that forum post quite recently because we were busy doing our presentation. It's working perfectly fine for him, and that's because he does it for a small subset of applications, and he does it for available targeted user applications. So he doesn't have that policy problem going down and having a lot of those applications coming down into his policy. So it works fine for him. It's a pretty neat solution for what he wants to do. But be aware, if you're doing it for anything else than available user applications, there might be implications performance-wise. And if you multiply that by a serious number of applications and a serious num number um, of machines or users you're targeting this to, this might become ugly real fast. All right? And that's it. I have some references up, and I have Jason up for the next portion of our presentation. More Steve Rahi. Anybody know Steve Rahi? Can you all recognize Steve Rahi? You, if you can't, it's really easy. He's about two inches taller than I oh. am and about 50 pounds. Steve Rahi is about this, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, so you're here. So, and <laughs> he's Steve. a little bit wider, but that's about Steve Rahi. And he's super intelligent, too. So Yeah, he is. If you find him, pick his brain. So last one. Um, good thing we didn't pick six. Um, service back one. Who's not on 2012? Not too many. You're going soon, right? 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 Who's not on 2012 SP1 yet? Uh, so quite a few people. So for some of you people, this might be rehash. Maybe you're a consultant in here, and you're going to do this multiple, multiple times, and run into multiple, multiple, hopefully not bad things, but things that you can work your way through. Should I upgrade SP1? Yes. Yeah, pretty easy there. Uh, what should I do to prepare? Common questions, gotchas, lots of gotchas out there. And the last one, do my clients upgrade? Just a couple of other little things in here we'll talk about also. Um, so I have a pretty explicit blog post that goes through all of these details, so that's at the end. Lots more detail about all these things. But some of the things that I found, right, is all of the prerequisites, they're a lot of them. They take a while to download. They take a while to copy out to all the servers. So if you're expecting to come in on Friday night and just do your upgrade, your hierarchy upgrade, uh, and just be done with it, well, plan for a long night if you haven't actually downloaded everything, because it just takes a while. A right? little thing that you don't really think about has nothing to do with any technical piece that's in there. But otherwise, you're going to get there at Friday at 8, and you're going to still be there at midnight copying these files out, potentially, right? Uh, especially if you're using the cloud or Mandalay's internet access. <laughs> Run the prereq checker. Keep running it. Just keep running it. Make sure. Right? Just because it gives you an error, as long as you know what that error is, you're OK. So if you happen to have a CAS and are unfortunate to have a CAS, if you run that prereq checker on a 
child primary site before, of course, you've upgraded the CAS, it'll give you an error. Oh, I'm at the wrong version. Well, you know, that's okay. But now you're going to check all your permissions because maybe the guy who actually installed Config Manager no longer there and he used his own account and it was his account that actually had all the permissions. And you didn't really realize it because you've never had to do everything in Config Manager. And now all of a sudden, you've got to go figure out what the account permissions are. So don't wait until you're about to upgrade to run the prereq checker. Run it the first day you guys start talking about it. Go figure out what some of these issues are, the things that it's going to identify. Upgrade SQL Server. This is a common topic. Just get it up to the latest CU. So they actually just changed the documentation, I think, in the last rev because it was a little bit misleading. Basically, they don't do any explicit testing on new CUs that come out. The product team doesn't. They make the assumption and everything above any CU level is supported. So whatever they state in the documentation as a CU level for SQL Server, above that is always supported. Uh, so just go do it. Uh, it. It works out well. You get all the wonderful goodness of SQL Server in there. Uh, get up to the most current service pack that you can. Uh, SQL Server upgrades are typically very painless, especially if all you have on there is Config Manager. Or if you're having to worry about other applications, it's a much bigger deal. But if it's just Config Manager, go ahead and do it. Back up your DBs, pretty easy there. The one little gotcha there, uh, and I realized this after I did it, of course, was if you're backing up to the same location, uh, having multiple backups is a great thing because you won't have different points in time, but if they're all going to the same location, you just lost that previous one that you had. So make sure you back it up, move it to somewhere else. So that can be pretty big. Kind of goes with that time thing again, right? Service Pack 1 isn't necessarily a difficult thing to do uh, technically, but time-wise, make sure you plan for it. It's not necessarily going to be a long weekend, uh, but it could be if you haven't accounted for these different little things. And also, if you're going to do the test DB upgrade, so there's a test DB upgrade that's actually in here, make sure that the SQL server that you're going to do the test DB upgrade on uh, actually has enough space for your DB. So I've run into that a few times. Hey, you guys got a test DB? Oh, yeah, great. Uh, yeah, our database is 50 gigs. Oh, we don't have that much free space on that test DB. So you got to plan for those kind of things. It's all about time. WSUS, I talked a lot about WSUS and the WEA yesterday. You're gonna, you should upgrade it because the number one problem of updates issues is having down-level WEAs. So plan for that along with um, uh, agent installs themselves. And then the last one, right, we all know, and I've got a different slide. I'll talk about that one a little bit. Uh, so post-upgrade, there's definitely some tasks. Make sure you update the client config package, right? Those are the two built-in packages. Just make sure you get those out to all the distribution points. I think it's supposed to happen automatically. I think most of us have seen that it doesn't happen automatically. So just go force it to happen so that it's on all the distribution points so that when you do go upgrade them, you have the most current content that's out there. Upgrading your clients, they fixed the built-in upgrade in Service Pack 1. Thank you, Eric Orman and his dev team. Um, so that it works really, really well. So internal Microsoft, we're talking 250,000 machines, something along those lines. They actually turned on the built-in auto upgrade for the client uh, and did all their systems across the board. I don't think it's complete yet, but that's what they're doing. I've used it. It works fabulously, right? It's essentially a set and forget. You set a checkbox, and all your clients start upgrading. And one small point of confusion, it's only for the service pack. So there's already a CU out for service pack one it won't do the CU. You still have to push the CU out through SCUP or for, through software updates or through some other manual process or software distribution, of course. Um, boot images, you can't use what you had there now, right? We went from the wake, which was PE 3.0 based, to ADK, which is PE 4.0 based. You can't use the 3.0 PE images right now. That's a problem in and of itself. Uh, but you can't use them, so just get rid of them off all your DPs. And it'll actually make your service pack uh, upgrade go a little bit quicker, too. Uh, and then you don't have to worry about them not actually being there after the fact, because you're going to have to push them out again anyway. So just get rid of them. Uh, and then learn about the new features, which hopefully you guys have all done here this week. So here are the three quick gotchas. There's one on, uh, on antivirus. Um, you might want to turn it off uh, before the upgrade and just re-enable it afterwards. There's, a, there's one particular issue that, uh, that's still unresolved uh, just yet for those of you that are using McAfee as uh, their antivirus uh, solution. McAfee has a knowledge base article out there. Uh, I think it's in our notes uh, in the session. There's a link to the knowledge base article. But they actually have a, a conflict with DISM, which is used to manage the, the boot images. And their on access control for McAfee actually stops DISM from running. Every time you try and run DISM, it'll give you an access denied message, no matter what permissions you have the on-access scan will basically prevent you 
from running DISM, um, and they haven't exactly yet identified as to why that is. So their current workaround is disable on access um, scanning uh, from McAfee. Because if you don't, then injecting new boot images is going to fail. Uh, and if you re-enable it after you've installed Service Pack 1, every time you hit update distribution points on a boot image, again, you'll have to make sure that the on access scan is off. Because again, that will fail. Because that just runs dism.exe as well. Um, and at, at present, there's no better workaround than dis disabling on access scanning on your uh, config manager server to make sure that dism.exe can actually successfully run. If not, you'll end up with an upgraded site that will have failed your boot images, and it, there won't be any boot images inside your environment. Right? So that's an issue we've run into. I think on our first SP1 installs, we ran into three times in a row. And we said, what, what's going on here? Until we determined the pattern. And then the knowledge base article was actually up quite well before Config Manager 2012 SP1 was there because it's a December knowledge base article. But if you're a McAfee customer, be aware of that. Can you hold till the end? Because we're like got three, four minutes left. So I want to get through like one or two more slides. Um, so the, real quick, the funny thing, that KB article, it's in here. Read it. It's actually funny. McAfee's like, we scan stuff. It's broke. We stop it. We think it's bad. Turn it off. I mean, it's just, it, it's like totally noncommittal. It's just funny. Um, so the other point on this slide, don't use McAfee, don't use VMware, but that's beside the point. Um, <laughs> when PE 4.0, right? vSphere down level. There's actually a BIOS hack someone was telling me about. I don't deal with VMware a whole lot, and when I'm in shops that do, I'm not the one who does it. So but there's a BIOS hack you can actually use, I guess, uh, to help it work. But there's still other down level systems that PE 4.0 won't work on. Right? That's a Windows product group decision. It has nothing to do with Config Manager. We're all suffering from it. Um, Windows product group likes to make decisions. But um, so they're working on a fix for this. Uh, there's actually a fix in the forums that you're that is not supported, but actually is reportedly working. So you can go find that one. I don't have that link in here. Uh, but the product group itself is actually actively working on a fix for this uh, and figuring out a way of actually using, hopefully, down-level PE images, because that's pretty much the only way to do it. The last one shouldn't affect anyone. It's been a long time. But in January, they found this issue. Once again, another product group's problem. They signed something incorrectly. They found this issue. So they had to correct that. The other product group did put it back on the media and reissue the media. So that was January 24th, something like that. So if you have media sitting around, so really the downloaded ISO from before January, just go re-download it uh, and don't worry about the KB. I mean, that KB article itself actually says there's a hot fix or re-download it. Just go re-download it and save yourself lots of pain and trouble. So here are all the references. Uh, that last one on there is the McAfee one itself, which like I said, is pretty funny. Um, and there's hyperlinks between, behind all of these in all of the slide deck. So that was our five topics. Ooh, deep wide. That's right. Don't drop the disk in and expect Config Manager to work. Don't be a ghost. If you know who you are, if you know what I'm talking about, use Bing. So one of the big things, if you have questions, Bing's wonderful. Even that other G thing sometimes gives you good answers, too. Um, forms in the lists, the whole front row here, pretty much. We answer form posts questions all the time. This is how we learn things, really, for the most part. And we love helping you in general. That's why we're here. Um, so go use them. Uh, and of course, the product group jumps in on occasion, and we get them involved also. So uh, that's the forums. And that's the Kim and Jason show with actually two minutes to spare, which I'm surprised. And that is MMS forever and ever and, and ever. ever. Thank you.